Good afternoon and welcome to Tuesday Talks at the White House, a weekly invitation for people around the country to engage with administration officials, policy experts, and more. This week, President Obama will award recipients of the National Medal of Science and the National Medal of Technology and Innovation, the highest honors bestowed by the United States government on uh, scientists, engineers, and inventors. For Tuesday Talks this week, we're so honored to have with us three of these medal recipients. Uh, Warren Washington to my right, Stephen Sasson, and Marianne Fox. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Corey Shulman in the Office of New Media. And for the past couple of days, you've been sending us your questions on Facebook and WhiteHouse.gov for the medal recipients to my right. Uh, we're going to get to your questions soon. If you're just joining us, go to WhiteHouse.gov slash live. There's a link to Facebook where you can join the chat, and we will be answering as many of your questions as we can in the live chat. Uh, before we hop into your questions, I'm going to turn it over to the medal recipients to my right to give a bit of background on, the, on uh, themselves and what it means to be honored in this way. Uh, tomorrow. So maybe, uh, Warren, can you start? I'm Warren Washington. I'm from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. I've been involved in uh, the modeling of the climate system since 1964. Uh, our group was one of the, of the pioneering groups to put together computer models. And since that time, the uh, area of climate change has become very important. And we actually can carry out simulations of the recent past climate into the future so that we can give uh, information to society and to the policymakers. Um, I come from a physics background and mathematics background, and that's what really got me started uh, at Oregon State University and, and then at, at Penn State for my PhD. Thanks, Stephen. I'm Stephen Sasson. And uh, I have been a member of the Eastman Kodak Company for over 35 years. And in that duration of time, I have spent my entire career involved with digital imaging. And so I've been part of the big transition to from silver halide imaging to digital imaging over the last three decades. Um, I got interested in, in this because I was interested in electronics as a young person. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute where I got uh, a bachelor's and master's degree. And uh, I've been uh, very honored, uh, extremely honored, uh, to, uh, to have been recognized for this award. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, the award. I'm proud also of, of my company and the people that I've worked with for all those years. Hi, I'm Mary Ann Fox. I'm the chancellor of the University of California at San Diego and a physical organic chemist. I think the thing that our research is most known for is photo-induced electron transfer and how it plays out solar energy and environmental remediation. We've been very interested in problems that relate to interfaces between solids and gas, gases and liquids, liquids and gaseous states. And being able to change reactivity by changing the characterization of that, of that interface at the nanoscale size. Uh, I'm delighted to have received this award. I think it's a tribute to my many brilliant students and colleagues who've worked on these problems for s several decades. Delighted to be here today. Thanks. Uh, Jamie West in the chat has said, hi Warren, hi Stephen, and hi Marianne. So, hi. Hi. Hi, <laughs> hi Jamie. Um, okay, so the first question, this comes from Donna Marie Bucant Alcott. Um, and this is, this is Donna Marie's comment and question. Given our current standing in the world in terms of science and math aptitude of high school students, and our diminishing numbers of those going into science and math careers, what should be done to turn the U.S. back into a science and math technology leaders? What motivated you and intrigued you about your field of study? And how can a parent motivate a gifted child to achieve his or her potential? So it's a, many parts to that question, but uh, whoever wants to take it away first. I think quality STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics really represents the future, not only of the United States, but globally as well. Uh, it's been very important to see how teaching methods evolved to focus on the effectiveness of science and, and engineering in particular. Um, and I'm happy to have been involved in science education uh, to this day. Uh, I think this is, a, this is a very good question, and it's a, it's a critical issue for our country. Um, 
I'm a big believer in, uh, in letting people have fun with science as well. I think we have to get away from being always right all the time. I, I like to say that we should encourage people to make mistakes because that's how you learn. And I like to say that inventors spend most of their time being wrong. Um, and so we have to celebrate the fact that people have to explore, make mistakes, and go forward. And sometimes the educational system sort of uh, try to be very efficient in always getting the right answer when sometimes the wrong answer, uh, you learn a lot more from it. Um, that plus enabling our science teachers uh, with more tools, uh, more background, more education. Technology is very hard to keep up with for anybody. And so uh, we have to really enable our science and education educators to, to, uh, to, to be able to kept up to date with the, the latest technology. Uh, and that requires a significant effort. We have to make it. Yeah, if I could just add one more thing, and that is that I think that students who are in either junior high school or high school should be encouraged to take advantage of uh, various summer programs. I think that they can learn that science and engineering and, and technology uh, um, occupations are, are interesting and challenging. I think that too many students are turned off by the fact that they just don't see themselves getting into uh, any of these fields. And by having some good summer experiences along with uh, exciting uh, uh, science teachers, I think is gonna be very critical to us changing things around. That's a really good point, Warren. And I think we have to recognize a lot of learning in science and engineering occurs outside of the classroom. I was very pleased to see President Obama have the, the science fair within the White House. Mm -hmm and to see the organization that Larry Bach brought to the mall uh, draw, draw, drawing tens of thousands of viewers and participants. It's really very encouraging. Okay, um, the next question, this comes from Alan Goretsky. And this is mostly directed towards Stephen. And, and a number of people have been asking similar questions. Um, he asked specifically about Kodak, but um, more broadly about digital photography. It's changed so much over the last decade. How do you see it evolving over the next decade? Well, it certainly has changed over the last several decades. Um, and uh, what, what's happened is, is uh, the ability or the opportunities people have to take their photographs have, have expanded. Um, and back 30 years ago, the photography system was based on silver halide, which gave great images. But when we introduced digital photography, we not only get great images, but we also have the ability to share our images instantly. So imaging now uh, becomes more than just a, a way to memorialize events. It's a way to have a casual conversation, uh, as many people do on Facebook and, and all the rest of the media sites. So uh, it's been an enormous change, and we're all adapting to it. And in the future, I think we're going to face some additional challenges. I mean, images are everywhere now. So perhaps we'll be better behaved, because we're always on camera, it seems. Um, and I also think that the pictures that we do capture, whether they be personal pictures or professional pictures, uh, there's more of them. So the ability to find them, to store them, to share them uh, is always going to be a challenge. So as we go forward, uh, we're going to have more opportunities, but we also have to have a way to, to organize these so that we can use them. And there's also the, the issue of, uh, of uh, format, what I call format obsolescence. You know, what you store your images on today, 10 or 15 years from now, may not be the medium of choice. And so there's always a way to, you have to always upgrade that storage. So that's going to be a challenge as well. But there's opportunities that have never been better uh, for imaging. Uh, pictures are everywhere. It's uh, sort of the universal language. And uh, uh, I think it's just only going to get more interesting from here on out. Uh, if you're just joining us, go to whitehouse.gov slash live. Click the link to Facebook. There's a live conversation happening right now where we're getting a lot of great questions um, for these three medal recipients that will be honored tomorrow for the National Medal of Science and the National Medal of Technology and Innovation. Um, we have a question that just came in from Joshua Gage, and this is on climate change. Um, on climate change, we can change the things like emissions from daily use um, in household items and transportation, but not nature. How many years will it take for us to see the effects of volcanic eruptions? Well, we can see on the volcanic eruptions in terms of their, their effect on the climate system very easily. If we have major eruptions, uh, the cooling of the earth uh, caused by aerosols in the stratosphere 
can last uh, of the order of, of uh, 18 months. Uh, but I don't think that you should think that the, on the volcanic eruptions are going to actually save us from, from global warming. Every time that you burn a, a, a molecule of uh, carbon dioxide is uh, generated, it has a lifetime of roughly 90 years. So the scientists are very concerned that, uh, you know, th that if we don't cut emissions now, that we're going to uh, cause on the Earth to warm up substantially over this next century or so. So uh, it's very important that we cut emissions uh, to on the lowest possible levels early so that we can forestall uh, you know, major climate change at the end of the century and into the next uh, few centuries. Okay, I've got another question for you. This comes from Nancy Orr. She asks, uh, Dr. Washington, what do you think of the manipulation of climatology research for political means by both sides of the debate? Well, this is a, this is a very uh, uh, difficult issue. Obviously, there's, there's some people who don't want to see anything done about climate change and others who, who are very zealous about uh, dealing with the environment. I think that the important thing is that the scientists of the world have got together and uh, tried to uh, uh, give uh, very reasoned, carefully worded statements to the policymakers. And I think uh, there's been a lot of misinformation about climate change. And unfortunately, uh, it's hard for the public to separate on the two. Uh, I, I think in terms of the bottom line, I would, would essentially recommend that people follow uh, the statements that come out of things like on the National Academies of Science and Engineering about climate change because um, they uh, have tried to, to uh, look at all aspects of the problem and, and, and provide uh, policy recommendations to the policy makers. And I think it, that, that all of those uh, statements are very carefully worded um, so that there's no misunderstanding of, of the consequences of climate change. Thanks. Uh, this next question, I think, is best directed towards Marianne. Uh, Levu uh, Stoiseku, uh, pardon me if I um, did not pronounce your name correctly, uh, asks, is chemistry important or very important? Chemistry is very important because it's, uh, in my opinion, the central science. If you know chemistry well, you can move to the interface with physics or biology. You can do uh, medicinal work. Uh, you can develop new drugs, new natural products. So it's quite central, I think, to progress. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from Kurt Coates. Uh, Kurt asks, what can we do to make solar panels more efficient and cost effective? Well, we've worked a little bit with the, the the basic science that goes on in solar panels. And of course, what you want to do is to have nanoscopic control so that you can control the particle aggregation that leads to imaging and to separation of charge. Uh, whether that gives practical consequences in terms of financing for ins installation of solar energy is the next generation, but one that is conceivable. I wonder if I could just add one more thing to, to what Marianne said. Uh, <clears throat> clearly, this is an example of where the technology keeps developing and that we're finding that, that we can bring down the cost and, and that we can make the, uh, on the solar panels much more efficient. So uh, an investment in the science and the engineering and the technology has paid off, I think, in terms of giving us a better product. It's an example, too, where basic science has led to practical applications in a very short period, really. Okay, uh, we've got a question. This came in from Nick Ezo uh, to the man from Kodak. I think he's talking about you, mm -hmm. Steve. Sorry, I missed your name. Okay. Uh, did you experience resistance to your discoveries in digital imaging uh, from your superiors because there was a threat to the film business? Mm -hmm. Can you say anything about industries being forward-looking and taking advantage of new technologies instead of holding on to new ones that will become obsolete? <laughs> Well, it's a good question because, uh, as you know, uh, Kodak as a company had been around for well over 100 years. And um, 
And so when you have a new, what I would call a disruptive technology that, that, that potentially could affect the business, you obviously get lots of questions and you get a lot of, uh, 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 well, lots of really critical questions. And uh, yes, I, when I developed the digital camera, yes, I was challenged quite a bit. But they were reasonably good challenges. You must remember that when you develop something for the first time and you put it out there, you're judging it in the present day context. That is, back in 1975 when I took my first images, uh, there were really no personal computers around. There certainly wasn't any internet or any of the things we take for granted today. So you can understand how people would be a little skeptical about uh, what I called filmless photography at the time. Um, having said that, I think inventors have to recognize that when you move forward with an idea, you have to recognize that the whole world's inventing along with you and that your idea may mature with additions from other fields uh, to something different than what you possibly could imagine. When I first proposed digital photography at Eastman Kodak Company, um, I wasn't thinking about the internet or any of the, the desktop photographic printing that we take for granted today. Um, and so consequently, I just thought of it a way as to not have a consumable and to capture images. But it's become so much more than that. And that's because of all the other developments that were being done in parallel fields uh, simultaneously, and then they all sort of coalesced in the, in the late 90s into the, the, the infrastructure which we celebrate so much today and we take for granted so much today. Pictures on, uh, over the internet or on Facebook, for example, we sort of take that for granted right now. But I don't think that was, it certainly wasn't in my thinking 30 years ago, and I don't know too many people who did have that thinking. So, Yes, you will always be challenged. Any good corporation always has to challenge itself and its fundamental uh, basic understanding of what they're based on. Uh, and you have to give people enough freedom to explore that. Uh, I was given that freedom and a number of people at Kodak did a lot of pioneering work in digital imaging. Not necessarily talked about so much, but it was, it was actually done. So companies really have to do that. If they don't, they, they do it at their own peril. Okay. Um, if you're just joining us, go to whitehouse.gov slash live. There's a link to join the live chat on Facebook where we're scanning your questions. There's a very active dialogue happening right now. We're trying to answer as many of your questions as we can. The next question comes from Chang Yu Yen. Uh, she says, uh, congratulations to all of the honorees. Great idea to have this discussion forum. Thank you all for participating. Uh, what are three things government can do to help our country become more energy independent in 10 years, and what are three things individuals can do to help? Wow. I might not hold you to three, but. Uh, <laughs> we'll start at the other end. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that, that we could at least start implementing in a faster way on present technologies. It's, it's sort of worrisome to me that China, uh, which is a very large emitter of, of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, has also uh, jumped in to take the lead on implementing re renewable energy sources and, uh, and that we seem to be holding back uh, for some reason. And I think that uh, by holding back, um, we aren't making the transition that we need to make. Yeah, I would, I, I would agree with what you, what you said. I also think that as, as individuals, we just become aware of our actions and, and what they can mean. I don't know, everybody talks about the light bulbs and things like that, but there are many things that we can do to sort of become a little bit more efficient in the way we utilize energy. And uh, I think uh, that's something that I think we've all become more aware of over the last 10 years. But I think in the end, uh, science, is, science and technology are going to be able to help us, lead us out of this. Uh, and uh, we've got to, as Warren indicated, we've got to make a, a real serious effort at this. This is uh, as critical a crisis as, uh, as we have. And uh, unless we address it in, a, in an, an intelligent and organized way, uh, we won't be efficient at getting the solutions. In fact, others may reach those solutions earlier than us. I'd say the third contribution that needs to be made is adequate support for science education. Science in the public interest has to be something that's understood well by the public. Otherwise, they'll never understand the requirement for investment going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Brenda Hogland. Uh, Brenda asks, does the White House have solar power? There are a lot of people that would love solar or wind power, but no way to afford it. And what is being done to um, uh, produce 
uh, sorry, the, the last bit. So let's stick to the first bit, which is does the White House have, White House have solar power and um, are there ways to make it more affordable for those that are interested? Uh, I think that, that they've just recently installed some solar panels at the White House, as far as I know, and, and uh, I don't know if it's fully functional or not. I can tell you we have solar trees at the University of California, San Diego. I have solar panels on my own house. Uh, that was with some government subsidy, some incentive to uh, achieve that. But I must tell you, my husband goes out almost every day and watches the meter go down. He really likes that in California. <laughs> okay, uh, the next question comes from Andrew Wade Nunn. This is for you, Stephen. Do you, think that the digital, do you think that digital photography has eliminated any portion of the raw fundamentals of photography that come with standard film photography? Uh, perhaps he means like artistic form I, and I, I creativity? I believe so. Is that what they're indicating? Yeah, still yeah that's, what, that's my Yeah, I, I think, you know, the technology has changed, but uh, the art is, stays pretty much the same. Um, great photographers are great photographers. They're great storytellers. And uh, whatever technology they use, um, uh, they learn to use that technology to tell their story. So uh, I've known some really great photographers, and they've done it with film, and they've done it with digital. Uh, you know, the, uh, the technology changes, but their mission stays the same. Tell the story in an elegant and artful way. That's what they do. So, no, I don't think digital has taken away. I think it's added. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question comes from Nancy Orr. Dr. Washington, uh, what do you think of the manipulation of climate... Oh, we've already, we've already addressed that question. Um, I'm going to move on to a different one. Uh, this comes from... Uh, Sorry, we've got, we've got a lot of questions coming in. If you're just joining us, go to whitehouse.gov slash live. Um, you can click the link to Facebook where there's a very active discussion, and I'm just trying to find um, some of your latest questions. This one comes from Nancy Orr. This is for Dr. Fox. What's the next big thing in chemical photonics? The next big thing in chemical photonics is understanding how uh, size influences excited states. So you can, we've already seen in the Nobel laureate work of, of Roger Chen that there are a number of dyes that can be used as markers for biological events. I think photonics will develop a whole range of materials uh, differing in size and character and shape uh, that will revolutionize our, our ability to manipulate molecules. Okay, we just had a question come in from Ruth Ness. This is for Dr. Warren. Uh, who was your favorite science teacher and was he or she better than Terry Chiaco? I don't know if that means anything to you. Oh. Your favorite science teacher. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, I was uh, very fortunate to have in high school a chemistry teacher who uh, did not answer the questions that students asked. <laughs> uh, she asked the students to turn around and try to find out the answer. And I thought, um, I asked on the question of why egg yolks are yellow, and she said, find out. And it took me uh, maybe a few weeks to uh, research on literature, found it had, had to do with seeds and the, uh, on the food that eggs eat that had sulfur compounds in them. And I wouldn't have found that out, I wouldn't have gotten started in science if that teacher had and just answered the, the question. I think the, on the quest of looking into it and trying to find out is what excited me about going into science. Relevant to that same question, uh, the Nobel Foundation is trying to stimulate young people, junior high and senior high, to, to provide questions, not answers. So it's very mm -hmm. much similar to what you're suggesting, right. that they're doing a competition. Now, it's actually a question I'd like to extend to each of you. Um, the Department of Education just launched a site called teach.gov, and they're asking a lot of fascinating people about their favorite teachers. So do you have a favorite uh, science teacher or inspiration? You know, uh, yeah. Well, I went to my freshman year at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I, I had a recitation session with a Dr. Robert Resnick, who was a very famous physics teacher. And uh, I must tell you, the guy was amazing in the sense that he really inspired me to the point where I'd do my homework, go to recitation, and then I'd see the elegant way in which he solved those problems. Absolutely elegant. He made it just look so easy, and I struggled for hours to get, I might even get the same answer, but he did it so elegantly. I'd go back to my dorm and redo the problems. 
I never did that before in my life, you know. And, and so, uh, to answer your question, I, I think it was Dr. Resnick. He was very, very inspiring to me. I think there's a continuum between teachers and mentors, and I had more mentors than I had teachers that did that same stimulation. The, the mentors I had helped me understand how science policy is done, why education is important, and why it's very important that people who end up in administration, as I have, continue their research group to keep active and alive in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the next question comes from Darlene Matthews. Uh, what would each of you propose is the most important item to focus on as we're developing tech in the future? So technology or sort of in your own field, what, what do you view as the most important item to focus on? You mean technology or? I mean, this is, yeah, this is technology specific. Um, but feel free to expand well, on that. It's a, it's a big question. Uh, yeah, well, well, at least I think that uh, uh, just keeping up <laughs> with, with the pace of technology, yeah. for example, the internet and the, and the way that we communicate uh, has been uh, wonderful, but it's also meant that you've really had to, to stay on, on task to be able to take advantage of all these new technologies. Uh, now, there are some, some negative aspects to it in, in that when I log on in the morning, I have 50 or 60 emails to sort of deal with. <laughs> But, but I've learned how to efficiently go through that. But, it, but on the other hand, on the positive side, it keeps me in contact with lots more people and, and lots more uh, colleagues. Yeah, I agree, Warren. Don't, the more technology we have, the further behind I feel. <laughs> uh, it, it always seems to be that way. Um, I, I don't know what the most important thing is. I, I think uh, I agree with Warren. Uh, just keeping up is a major challenge. Uh, for people, and so that means you have to be more selective in what you what you concentrate on, which in turn means that you have to depend on your fellow scientists and explorers to focus on other areas, and then trust that they're doing the work that you can rely on. And so, and in a sense, we're sort of uh, we're, we're this technology is driving us to have a higher degree of trust uh, among each other, and uh, and I th I think that's great, um, but that's always a challenge. Uh, when you're working in you know, competitive fields and things like that. Just elaborating a little bit on that, I think many of the most important problems in science transcend the traditional disciplines that we've had at our colleges and universities. Very rarely is something all physics or all biology or all medicine. They're very often combinations of fields that lead to the most promising discoveries. And I think that's going to be even more so. And it's just an elaboration of what Stephen was saying. And, and I think I can just add just a tiny bit on that. It, I think it's important for people who go into science or engineering or technology that they do sort of, sort of uh, get as part of their educational experience a broad range of subjects yeah. and not overly specialized right at the start. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, we've got another question that's coming from Alice Popejoy. Dr. Fox, thank you for setting an expiring example for women and girls in STEM fields. We all know that there is a gender gap in high-level science careers. What motivated you to be successful, and what advice can you give young investigators for advancing their careers to the next level? Well, I, I hope you don't mind my disclosing my age by saying I was in the end of the eighth grade when Sputnik was launched. But there was a strong encouragement at every stage for boys and girls uh, to at least think about careers in science. And if you thought deeply about science, you, you had the really quite stra straightforward consequence of loving it. So I ended up loving it when I was in the equivalent of a junior high school. And I've never looked back. I can't imagine my life without some part of discovery and science investigation as key ingredients. OK, the next question comes from Sean Bedwell. Sean asks, what would your second job be if science was not around today? Anything? I don't know, your second job, anything. How much money do we have to make? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it would be a university chancellor. I love my job. Um, any other second careers? No. no. OK. <laughs> well, um, I've got a, a, this question comes from G. Allen Miller. 
for Dr. Washington, my 11-year-old son would like to know if you have any theories on ways to reverse global warming. Well, I don't know if we can reverse it. It would be nice if, if we could do it, if we could find a way to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, but I think, uh, well, I, it, it may be possible to sort of do that, but the technology hasn't arrived yet. Uh, but I think the next best thing is to cut emissions of greenhouse gases. Okay, uh, this is our last question. I think that this is a great one to close on. This comes from Anne Marie Mounts. Uh, she asks, what does receiving the National Medal of Science, um, or uh, your, not the, you know, the National Medal technology of uh, Technology and Innovation. And innovation. Yes. Um, so for you, technology and innovation, for uh, the rest, science, what does it mean um, to each of you, both personally and professionally? Well, I think for me, it, it, it really represents uh, a field that has uh, emerged you know, where in the early days that we would, I don't think that we would imagine that we could simulate the climate on the computers. Uh, but uh, it's, it's important to emphasize that this isn't just me. It's a, it's a team of scientists and engineers and co computer experts who have, have worked uh, as a team to uh, to be able to model on the atmosphere and the climate system on modern day supercomputers. And um, I think uh, on the receiving of the medal uh, honors not only me, but, but on many of my colleagues. Um, to me, in the, the Technology and Innovation Award, it's just a, it's, it's, it's a great thing. Uh, I, I just, uh, I'm really moved by it. Um, you know, I started doing digital photography very early on, and it was just a, a real crude technology, and it was basically dreams. And then to be fortunate enough to participate over the last 35 years with an absolutely fantastic team at my company, Eastman Kodak Company, and working with thousands of men and women there to help develop that field into the, the present field that everybody seems to like and use today has been very, very gratifying. So uh, to, to be recognized this way, as Warren points out, it's you're, you're just one person in a, in a whole group of people that's uh, you know, trying to do something uh, interesting and helpful. And so it's a really great honor. I felt much the same way that in doing the work, the work is really rewarding in itself. And having colleagues and students in particular who you could observe growing from rather immature textbook scientists to really practicing scientists who are inventive and are going to generate the next round of technology and uh, help the government make decision, data-based decisions uh, is very, very important. Not only for me, uh, I think anyone, there are many people who have done things that won't have the chance to be so honored uh, and so I'm appreciative of that but also just because it brings together so many different people uh, in support of what the world needs and what the United States needs. Well, thank you so much, um, Warren, Steve, and Marianne for joining us. Thank you to everyone that was involved in participating in the conversation on whitehouse.gov and Facebook. This video will be posted shortly on whitehouse.gov. And be sure to watch the live stream of the award ceremony tomorrow on whitehouse.gov. There will be more information there. Um, and, and have a good afternoon.